you know, you see some great cocktail spots pop up mm -hmm. or, you know, these new restaurants. Um, what was the one I'm trying to remember? I think I was talking to you about it. The restaurant that just popped up in Hanover Square, um, right over near where Manhattan's was. It's like a little oh, spot. Eden. Um, Eden, Eden, yeah. yeah, yeah. Eden's exceptional. Great spot. Yeah, and phenomenal. like when you're in there, uh, just you don't feel like you're in Kyush. You no. know, it's like yeah. you know, I love that, and it's it's good to see that kind of stuff. Yeah, Eden is uh, Eden is without a doubt the best restaurant in Syracuse, no question. I yeah. mean, um, 100 percent wood fired kitchen. Yeah, which I tell people that like whenever I, I own as a separate business, I own a food tour, so we do give walking food tours around downtown in the summer. And uh, then the, the number one question, what's your favorite? I'm like, the best is Eden. There's no, and I'm like, it's a hundred percent wood fired restaurant. And everybody looks at me like, <laughs> yeah. like, they have to build a fire in their kitchen every night yeah. to heat, to cook your food. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this one group, they were like, I don't, what are you talking about? They have to build a fire. Yeah. So I called the chef, I called the owner and chef Rich. I was like, are you in the restaurant right now? He's like, yeah. I was like, I'm bringing five people over to show them your restaurant real quick. Yeah. And they were astounded by it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's something, you know, that, you know, it's definitely a trend all over the, you know, it pops up in major cities around the country, right? Wood fired kitchens. Um, but he's doing it, you know, really, really well. Yeah. And uh, it was cool. I mean, he, he built out the entire restaurant from like by himself, yeah. you know, with wow. limited help. I mean, built the line, built the bar. I mean, it, it's just crazy the amount of effort that he that Rich has put into stuff. Yeah, but, food uh, is great for sure. Yeah. He did a good job and local. I mean, yeah, we did. I did a video last year, and we're going to follow the trend this year, and that is I follow food from the farm to it being processed. Uh, to go into the restaurant and then the restaurant cooking with it. Cool. And so last year I, I started the series out with a chicken. Mm -hmm. It was at this local farm in Truxton, husband and wife, you know, uh, infants that they've got like strapped to their back as they're like <laughs> processing chickens. Um, you know, the husband is going up to the trailer and like saying a prayer over the chickens and, you know, before like thanking God for the, wow. you know, for the animal sacrifice before he <laughs> process. I mean, that kind of a, you know, local farm sustainable. They've got cows, they have pigs, they've got egg layers and meat birds. And, um, and so I hung out with them as they were slaughtering and processing their chickens wow. one morning and filmed it. And then went to Eden, who buys their chickens, and filmed a video with their sous chef uh, cooking uh, one of the dishes wow. with the chicken. So this year that we're do I'm doing that with a pig. I'm doing that with a cow, um, possibly with a duck if there's any. I know there's like local duck eggs. And then, a, you know, a variety of like produce um, to just kind of show that whole process. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Um, it's good for people to see, you know. Yeah, so. and those are the things that upstate New York is excels at. Yes. I mean, you know, there, there's so many different wonderful local farms. Yes, you know, whether Absolutely. it's protein or produce, um, the winemakers and you know the Finger Lakes region, all yeah. that kind of stuff. It's great, you know. So I was explaining that to to David a little bit just because he's you know he's from the Bay Area, so mm -hmm. he's you know he grew up around Napa. Yeah. So that's the best way for me to, you know, kind of explain. It's like a mini, you know, definitely not on the same scale as Napa, but, yeah. you know, it has that feel for the East Coast, at least, you mm -hmm. know, you know, the Finger Lake sure. region is beautiful. And then us spending time out in Skinny Atlas a little bit today, even though I didn't get to show him, you know, the lake and it's not summertime when it's right. really popping, but still you get a vibe. It's just a, it's a different, it's kind of a different vibe from, yeah. you know, what you get, you know, sent like right in downtown or. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Skinny Atlas is maybe the best of us. <laughs> I'd like yeah. to think, you know, Skinny yeah. Atlas is is great, especially the summertime. Um our my family's been going out there when you know, growing up, we never vacationed in like Disney. We went to Skinny Atlas. Yeah. Um and so we've had <laughs> lake houses out there and all that kind of stuff for yeah. years. So um Skinny Atlas is is really great. Yeah. Um, it is a beautiful area. Some great food. I don't think there's I mean hidden fish is gonna be like the nicest thing that's out there. Yeah. You know, so hidden fish was really, really good. Um sushi chef you know, whatever they call a sushi chef. Uh, phenomenal, really cool. Food was great. Nothing like that in central New York, really. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you guys have got, a, obviously, a lot of that in L.A. Um, and I've, I've always tried to follow Bourdain's rule of if you can't see the ocean, don't order fish. Yep. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, Huge fan of Anthony. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was really good. And their, their bartender, I hate to call him a bartender, mixologist, I forget his name, but really off the wall character from New Orleans. Interesting. And uh, re I mean, we were sitting there at the bar having dinner, and and 
the way they've got it set up is they've got like 80% of the bar, the counter space is for the like food preparation, right? With the, the chef. And then the rest of it is the mixologist who's still like right up in the front. And so we were sitting right there in his corner. And so we were chatting with him and, and, uh, and, you know, we were like, are you from there? And he, he was like, no, I just moved up from New Orleans a month ago. A friend of mine said there was a, some cool opportunities out here in the Finger Lakes, so I decided to come up. He's like, it was good timing because my girlfriend had just broken up with me, and, and next thing I know, there was like four guns pointed at my head. And I was like, if that isn't a New Orleans story, I don't know. What, right, don't know totally, what for sure. <laughs> <It's wild. laughs> uh, I was like, that's that's somebody that's from New Orleans for yeah, sure. Yeah, he's not um, going to be too happy that you know these kind these couple months, <laughs> but when it's a little colder, but uh, yeah. summertime, I'm sure it'll. Yeah, but he was making some great cocktails. Nice, some really great cocktails out there, and uh, love that. Yeah, and definitely on the higher end price point for sure. I have know? to try to talk to Adam and you know, once yeah once it gets kind of moving in uh, Elephant and the Dove, you know, and see see what we can do with uh hidden fish maybe even crabs you know yeah for sure yeah yeah all those places um we'll chat afterwards i mean i've got you know i could give you a whole list of spots to yeah. hit up in syracuse that are you know legit so for sure um, appreciate that well why don't we pour some mezcal and yeah. um while you're doing that why don't you guys introduce yourselves to everybody okay uh my name is richard Castro. uh this is david martin to the left of me so um David and I met at the we started uh, we started um, bartending together at the JW Marriott Ritz Carlton in LA Live right across from the Staples Center. Okay, and um, I'm actually from I'm from Syracuse originally, so I went to Liverpool High School. I moved out to um, I moved out to Los Angeles 15 years ago. Wanted to escape the the winters. That was really it. You know, I just wanted to try something different. My parents always said, you know what, if, if it doesn't work out, you can always come back, you know, 15 years later, you know, here we are. So, um, but we, we met, um, bartending together at the JW and Ritz Carlton. And we met our third partner who is now our third partner. He was just a, a bar patron, just, you know, would come in all the time. His name is Victor. He's from Mexico city. Mm. So just over the time of him coming in, talking to us, telling us stories about Mexico. And then, you know, eventually got to the point where he would say, uh, you know, I, I would love to take you guys there sometime and show you around. And, you know, it was always on our, uh, an idea, you know, I always wanted to, you know, visit Mexico city, um, especially just because knowing that it was different than, you know, your Cancuns, your Cabos, your Puerto Vallarta's, you know, just more of Americanized areas, mm. uh, more for tourists. You know, I knew that there was a lot more culture, rich culture in Mexico City. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we we took them up on it. We went on a trip out there and it I mean, I, I'd safe to say it changed our lives, mm. you know, forever. It was a magical place, just beautiful. I mean, the culture, the food and, and more importantly, the mezcal, the mezcals we were tasting at the time. This was this was probably about eight years ago. This was before the mezcal scene really started to pop off. Hmm. Um, you know, there was a couple of mezcals out, but nothing crazy. And the ones we were tasting behind the bar, we were just like, eh, you know. And then we got to Mexico City and we were trying these mezcals and they were just night and day. We were like, hmm. wow, this is this is mezcal. This is amazing. So when we got back, um, I remember him and I, we got done with a shift and we were sitting in my car and he said to me, he goes, what do you think about you know, us doing our own mezcal. And I was mm. like, I love it, but I have no idea where to start. Where, where do you start? You know? And he's like, I don't know either. So he's like, let's talk to Victor and, and see. So the three of us just kind of got together and started Googling how to start a liquor company. And, mm. and basically from there, I started taking trips to Oaxaca and asking cab drivers where the Palenques are and, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, just started going to, um, you know, to different places and tasting and meet people and, um, and then here we are now, you know, so That's it's, wild. it is pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what made you choose? I mean, obviously you're there, but what made you choose like, you know, Mezcal, did you look at anything? Did you look at like a tequila? Did you look into, you know, you know, bourbons or whiskeys or anything like that? Yeah, I think, um, I think one, I think just being in Mexico city, you know, like as uh, Richard was saying, drinking all these Mezcals, it was you know, we were just blown away, blown away by how good it was. Mm -hmm. um, I think we just really fell in love with Mezcal. And we, you know, we had been drinking tequila, bourbon, gin, vodka, everything behind the bars, bartenders, <laughs> right? Uh, but, yeah, I think we just really fell in love with Mezcal, the flavor of it. It was different. Um, I think tequi the tequila market was also very saturated, yeah, too. Yeah. That's, that you was, know, that, that was... was but, but I think it was a genuine love for Mezcal. I mean, we just... We like tequila. I mean, agave spirits in general. Yeah. But I think we... 
you know, when we went to Mexico City, we were drinking both, but we were both just, um, you know, just drawn to the, the flavor, the taste of mezcal. And I think learning about it was so mysterious to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I think just the complexity of the spirit. And even today, you go to, you talk to people, what's a mezcal? <laughs> oh, it's a really, really smoky tequila, you know? And then you, you're like, all right, you got a couple minutes to sit down and, you know, listen to us, you know? Yeah, but seeing that also, that opportunity, like, there wasn't much to be found. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's good. You like it? That's really good. So, yeah. Cheers, man. Yeah, so cheers. Good. Wow. Yeah. It's strong, but it's subtle. You know, it doesn't like over, it doesn't like kill your palate like some mezcals yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a 90 proof. I mean, to be honest with you, um, from what we have learned, and this is all from the information that we've taken in, you know, from mescalaros around Oaxaca and, you know, the people that we've worked a lot with, but um, <clears throat> especially in big cities, Los Angeles, New York, a lot of mezcal forward agave bars um, won't even talk to you if your bottle is anything under 90 proof. Really? And the main reason mm. is because the higher the proof, you, you get so much more flavor out of it. Now it's up to the Mescalaro to really take that and work their magic and mm. get it to the point where it's still strong but doesn't taste like you're ta you know drinking gasoline. You mm. know, But some of the best Mescals we've ever tasted are like 100 proof out of the still. Mm. Just phenomenal. Like the, the flavor is just l unlike anything else. So, still smooth, even yeah. at that high uh, proof. Mm. Yeah, still smooth. So we wanted something well-balanced, something yeah. where like the Mescal enthusiast can walk into a bar and order this and sip it neat or on the rocks. But also for people who are just learning about mezcal, who this is like their first time, um, you know, great in a cocktail. And they can mm -hmm. drink it in a cocktail. Because it's 90 proof, it really stands up in the cocktail and it doesn't die out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> so what is the process? Because, I, you know, I know uh, there are a lot of people that just think it's, you know, smoky tequila, right? Right. But, um there's a process to it, isn't it? Just essentially, it's kind of like, I mean, it's maybe a bad <clears throat> analogy, but it's essentially like the equivalent of char in the oak barrel. Am I wrong? Yeah, similar. Uh, yeah, um, so to just to let, we always like to let people know, technically, a tequila is a form of a mezcal. So okay. it's actually the opposite of what people think. Yeah. So what we like to teach that mezcal is mezcal, tequila is tequila. They're mm -hmm. really their own spirits. And definitely mezcal is not a tequila or a smoky tequila. Mm -hmm. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, so we just always love to yeah. clarify That's that. First message. and foremost, let's just get that out of the way. Exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> some of the differences, you know, that, well, what is, why is it different? Uh, same family, agave, right? They're mm -hmm. both agave spirits. Tequila only comes from Blue Weber, mm. where mezcals come from a lot of different species of agave. Uh, our flagship is uh, Espadine. Okay. And I would say Espadine is like the heart of mezcal. If you had to pick one uh, species of agave to mm -hmm. represent mezcal, I would say it's Espadine. Mm. Um, Mainly so because it's, it takes the least amount of time to grow to maturity. So it's the most gotcha. popular. It's the, it's the most abundant, right? Now, you know, yeah. Every, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so. Mezcal's cooked underground. That's where you do get that smokiness. Yeah. You get those wood notes because uh, it's cooked with wood and rocks underground. Mm. So that's where it's getting that characteristic. Um, so that's the, you know, tequila steamed in conventional ovens. I don't gotcha. know the whole tequila process. I'm not, yeah. but um, that's probably like the one of the biggest differences mm. is how, how it's created, how it's produced. And they, re they really don't taste alike if you were yeah. to sip a tequila right. and sip a mezcal like they don't really you might catch the agave similarity but they're very you know they don't Completely taste alike. Yeah. and most tequilas are all 80 proof i mean if you look mm -hmm. at them i mean they're across the board you know um so and then if you look at a lot of really solid good mezcals um most of them are 90 you know 92 96 you know yeah. the, the proof is a little bit higher there are some good mezcals that are under 90 proof but mm -hmm. Um, you do lose a little bit of the flavor. I mean, and yeah. that's that's the goal with the mezcal is really to get the most out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is based on, you know, the terroir. We always say that mezcal, you can you can kind of compare it a lot to um, wine. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it's just, you know, a lot of the influences of what grows around it, um, you know, changes the the flavor profile. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, a, a 2019 cab somewhere in Napa, and then from the same spot, and then a 2022 could taste totally different. Sure, it's similar with with mezcal. I mean, we're we're on our we're going on our fourth batch, and mm. all three batches have slightly tasted a little bit different. And it's not it's not about consistency. It's not really trying to do that like tequila. Yeah, you kind of want to 
show people that you kind of want to make it like, oh, that batch one, I really loved that taste. I'm going to hold on to that bottle. You know, batch two was great too. Maybe it's a little bit more peppery. Maybe there was a, a fire, a wildfire near and the ash mm. got into the soil and it influenced the, the flavor a little bit or some citrus trees or the elevation or the mist. That's you know, there's, there's a lot that can kind of tie into it that can change the flavor just subtly. And most people can't tell the difference, but mm -hmm. yeah. you know, we, we can, you know, sometimes, you know, it's a little bit this or a little bit that, um, and it's fun. It just it kind of makes it, um, you know, the learning process of it. Um, mm. And you know, we're we're students of the game. We're still learning, you know, every day about this this business and about mezcal. So yeah, um, it's kind of what drew us to it originally. You know, just to you know, just so much to learn about it and the complexity of it. Yeah, for it's sure. Great. So is it is it an aged spirit or is it essentially like cooked underground with like the wood and the rocks and then immediately put in the process? So it's actually like it's it's actually aged organically in the growth of the plant. Okay. So um, a lot each mezcal has a different timeline of when it's t taken down. Some mescaleros like to take it down a little bit sooner than others. Some like to let it grow to its full amount. Like an espadine is. What do we say? Anywhere from like five to eight years, yeah. give or take. You know, a tobala wow. sometimes is anywhere from eight to 12. Mm. You know, it just depends. There's tepastate, which is a type of mezcal, which takes like 25 years to, for one plant to grow to maturity, wow. which is a little bit more of a rare plant, which is why if you do find it in a in a bar, it's a little bit pricier, mm -hmm. you know, because it is more rare. But, um, you know, where tequila, where you take it and you age it in barrels, you know, there are some mezcal brands that age it uh, or put it in a barrel mm -hmm. where, what again... What we've been taught is it's kind of a no-no, you know, yeah. because you're taking this beautiful, natural, organic flavor that aged on its own in the growth process, and then you're throwing it in a barrel and kind of masking that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of frowned upon mm -hmm. a little bit, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, but some people do it, you know, and I think they just do it. I mean, Americans love to see that, you know, yeah, they love sure. to see color and, <laughs> you know, different, you know, oh, it's been aged this long, so it must be phenomenal where, you know, you could find some really good mezcals that have been aged just within the growth of the plant and they're going to taste unbelievable. Yeah. There is, um, there's a, there's a really phenomenal distillery, uh, up here called Old Home Distillers, a couple mm -hmm. of brothers and, uh, who, who have it and run it. They do a lot of whiskeys, a lot of bourbons, um, and they do a gin. They don't do too much clear stuff. Um, but they just – so they're – you know, in New York State, there's the New York State farm license that is a lot easier to acquire if you're a brewery, a distillery, or if you're a bar that's trying to get your liquor license. You know, you don't – it's not nearly as expensive. It doesn't take as long. And uh, But the challenge is you can only – buy and sell from New York State uh, distillers or breweries who also have that farm license. Gotcha. So I ran a bar, there was a partner at this bar um, who had a farm license, and, you know, we couldn't, we were never going to get a rum. I think there is a New York State rum, but it's not very good from what I remember. But we're not going to get tequila or a mezcal or anything like that. You know, you're really limited. So what they did is they took a whiskey and aged it in a mezcal barrel, and I forget, maybe two or three years. Um, and the result was essentially a whiskey that had strong, that strong smoky flavor that you get from a mezcal. Interesting. Which, you know, kind of gave, like, you know, when you have a farm license, you look for any and every <clears throat> trick that you can find to, of course. Make, yeah. to make a normal cocktail for somebody, yeah. you know, that's not an old-fashioned. And uh, <laughs> and that really opened up the the world of it because it was it was really solid. But I think they did a barrel of it and it was gone. It's so interesting because we're actually working on something the opposite. So mm. there's uh, there's actually some whiskey barrels mm -hmm. that we have been playing around with that age in uh, the mezcal. Mm. We take the agave spirit, put it into the whiskey barrels, and age it for about a year. Wow! And um, we've tasted the final product, and it's. I mean, we it's were amazing, both floored. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. phenomenal. And that's one thing. That's our first kind of like stepping outside the traditional yeah. mezcal. Yeah. Because we we would like, you know, we are developing some of the other species. Mm -hmm. And we do like to the, keep it traditional so you get to taste what real mezcal tastes like. But this is a kind of a one-off. But, it, I mean, it's phenomenal. Yeah. 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 You, got, you have to, I mean, you have to have an open mind thinking forward with, you know, some different ideas. You know, we're... Mm -hmm. We're working on multiple expressions. I mean, obviously, this is our flagship. This is what kind of got us out there, and, you know, we're really pushing it. But 
Um, you know, like David said, we're working on some different species, some tobola, mexicana, maybe a pachuga, maybe mm. a quiche. Um, but we're also, um, one of our next projects is a mezcal rosé. Mm. So it's actually the, the same espadin um, plant, but mm. aged in a wine, red wine barrel for about 30 days. Gives it a little bit of the color. Yeah. And it would be the same bottle, but clear. That's cool. So you can see the color. Um, and um, I just, my mixology mind is just firing on ideas. You yeah, know, for I, sure. I really, I mean, it'd be great anyways just to just to sip, but mm. um, I mean, the cocktails you could do with that, with um, mm. like a, a play on like a French 75 or like something with strawberry and like, mm. you know, even some rose water, rose petals, you know, you could really, you could really do some fun stuff with it, you know, yeah. especially for summertime. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, my mind's like firing right now with a ton of ideas <laughs> for the mezcal, but uh, right, right? It remind me to talk about all these things after the fact. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. So, you know, I don't know if you guys are cool with talking a little bit of like the nuts and bolts, but I'm fascinated at the process of having the idea to start your own, you know, liquor company yeah. and, and then the process of what that looks like, especially one where I'm assuming it's, it's similar to like, there's one place in the world that you can go to have this made yeah. essentially. Right. And yeah. it's not like, it's not like you can go find a, a producer in California and, and go have your. Well, if you did, it couldn't be called mezcal. It'd be like agave spirit or something okay. like that. So yeah. to be cal- classified as a mezcal, just like tequila, just mm-hmm. like champagne. Champagne. It has to come to. Wine, yeah. mm-hmm. For mezcal, it's nine states. Um, a mm-hmm. Oaxaca being the motherland. Yeah. To be actually classified as a mezcal. Yeah. That's wild. But we do know, uh, I've met a couple, I met a brand, I can't remember the name, nice guy, he was growing his own agave in California, hmm. and he's got a he's got an agave spirit, and it's, you know, hmm. it's, I had it, it's, it's not bad, you know, it's not, it's not, it's, not, it's not, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. not like from Oaxaca, but it's, it was pretty good, like, I, I respect, you know, I, I liked his, his vision, you know, trying to be different. Yeah. All right, so you go to Mexico City, and... You know, or you go to Oaxaca and you jump in the cabs and start saying, like, take me to yeah. wherever you recommend. And then, you know, what's that process like? It's like a process of elimination. You just, it's all networking. You know, they take us somewhere and it's the three of us, me, myself, David, and Victor. And, um, you know, and then we, you just talk to these mescaleros and just, it's it just the learning process begins. You know, it's just, we learn about it, we taste it, and then, you know, we get back in the cab and we're like, the three of us are like, all right, that's not for us. You know, I think the one important thing that everybody should know, too, is that, you know, we we didn't, you know, the three of us don't come from a lot of money where we just, you know, went down there and said, okay, we'll take that one, let's slap some labels on it and let's just start marketing it. Yeah. You know, we're fully funded by the three of us. We put all of our, you know, all of our hard-earned money into this. Mm. And so we, and we're g- genuine fans of Mezcal. So we really wanted to bring something back that we would sit down at the bar and drink. Mm. So we were prepared to, we knew it was going to take some time. You know, yeah. we knew it was going to, you know, we were going to taste some bad ones. We were going to taste some good ones. Um, we were going to taste some that maybe the, it didn't work out and, and, and some that were really good that made the decision hard, but, um, it was a process. It was a lengthy mm. process. It was a lot of trips to Oaxaca. Um, had to jump through a lot of hoops because especially coming out with a spirit, um, that is from Mexico, you have to do a lot of, you know, there's a lot of legal paperwork in Mexico. There's a lot of paperwork here in the States. Mm. You know, you have to almost mirror everything. Mm. So it was, it was definitely a lot of work. Um, but we finally came across the uh, Martinez family, and Abel is our, you know, he's our mescalero, and um, we, we, he's a little bit younger, and we love the idea of kind of growing with somebody with us, mm-hmm. you know, um, and mm-hmm. his mezcal is just phenomenal from the second we tasted it, and we loved the planque, and we loved the family, and um, it was, uh, it took some time, but we, you know, we felt like when we tasted it, we all looked at each other, and we're like, this is it's it, them. this yeah. is it. Yeah. So is it is it you find your you know you find your grower essentially you find your producer and they're growing and distilling or is it is there, are those two would, separate people? Uh, ultimately, yes. Um, yeah. So like Abel, they they grow the agave as well. Mm-hmm. There there could be other scenarios, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm, I know there's some big bigger brands that they probably they're mescalero like maybe they only have so much capacity, so then they have to. You have to source right. from other yeah. places, other people. Yeah. A lot of people out there they just sell agave, mm-hmm. Um, mm. but ultimately, yeah, you know, you want you find your producer, yeah, and um, you know, most of them are providing the, the they're growing the agave. 
Yeah, and yeah. I think and I think like take Del McGay, for example. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with his his um you know his expressions and stuff, but mm -hmm. he has a lot of single village. Yeah. Oh, so okay. which means that you know it's coming from that village. That's you know, if it's not single village, it means it could be outsourced from a couple other villages yeah. to come to. You know, if it if they need to, you mm -hmm. know, maybe there's a shortage or you need to. Maybe yeah. you're just buying a lot and you need, you know, you need to kind of blend it together, which is totally fine. It's it's, right. a, it's a great flavor. But um, when you can do a single village, which like he has Chichicapa and some a couple of different Tobalas and um, a couple of different Espadines, you know, but from specifically from that village, um, yeah. hmm. you know, it, it makes it a little bit um, more. It's, it's a rarer type of, you know spirit that you're coming out with because it the abundance of it is only so only goes so far mm. but um it's interesting it's kind of cool just to you know to see how you have to i mean it's even like that with winemaking sometimes winemakers need to borrow grapes from a farm yeah you know or a vineyard a little bit further down the road or For something sure. like that you know it's very similar but you that. embrace yeah. that and you you tell your your customers what you have and it, right and it, it's kind of fun because then it's like oh this is a di this this batch is different it comes not only from santa domingo alboradas but over here in chichicapo or from Amatiklan or like where, wherever it may be, you know, yeah. um, and it's just, it makes it, you know, that batch a little bit different. As you can mm. see on our bottle, I mean, we, you know, we have, you know, batch number, you know, we have the the yeah. um, bottle number, the, mm. you know, the year it, it's grown in and then on the side, you know, the type of still and, you know, the mescalaro and everything like that. So as mm. we continue to evolve, um, if we have different types of expressions or if it comes from a different source, you know, we're going to include that. I mean, we, yeah. there are some brands that don't even talk about their mescalaro, which is kind of crazy to mm. us because they put so much hard work and effort and sweat into this, um, you know, and you want to you want to give them props for it because yeah. they do such an amazing job. And until you can actually go there and see mm -hmm. how they do it, it's hard to, um, you know, really give them the the. Um, the respect that they deserve, you know? So, yeah. um, hmm. it, it's, it's great to kind of see that. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. important to us to make sure that we give Abel and his family like credit they deserve. Yeah, like he was cool. saying something about single, um, I don't know, I'm not going to say single village <laughs> because, you know, but you're getting yeah. agaves from it's, it's because he has that trademark. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it. for when you're getting a, um, like ours, you know, our agave comes from Santa Domingo Alvaradas. Mm. Abel makes it, mm. you can, you can trace to it. That's some, that I think it's more unique and yeah. those tend to be a little more pricey because it's rather than like you got a bunch of agaves coming from all these areas that you don't know, mm -hmm. almost you know, maybe this is really like layman's terms, like a blended scotch yeah. versus like a single malt for sure. Maybe that's not yeah, the best exactly. example, yeah. but um, and I'm not like hating on that because, like you said, you can yeah. still get some amazing mezcal, but a lot of the commercial brands, like that's kind of how they're rocking, right? They don't really, you know, like they don't even name their mescaleros, you don't really know where the agave is mm. coming from. Um, yeah, so it's kind of <laughs> just a mezcal, you know? yeah, yeah, and those, right. some of those are not something that for, great, yeah, something for the listeners to understand, you know, if yeah, you're going sure. and you're looking to pick out a bottle, like. If you really want to get into mezcal and you want to try a good product, you know, they, it should talk about the mezcalaro. Right. It should say where it's from in the region and the still it's made from. And, you know, you should see that information on there. Yeah. I mean, that's one, you know, tip out yeah. there for people that are looking to, you know, go out there and buy a bottle. Yeah, I've talked to a couple people just like, hey, I've got these guys coming to the podcast. They started a mezcal company and a little bit. And, you know, the people that I've spoken to from like the liquor world, who understand a little bit about it, they're like, you know, the only thing that we don't like about Mezcal is you, there, there's not much transparency. Like, the, you don't see as much transparency. It was kind of funny that they made this um, as you do in tequila. But tequilas nowadays, I mean, there's been a big, bigger movement over the last, like, year and a half or two about, you know, actually great finding great tequilas and not the stuff that's just crammed full of, totally. you know, whatever. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that is, so, I mean, that's been great to see, but they're like, but you don't see a lot of transparency in the Mezcal world. So that's really cool that you're putting all that information, you're introducing people yeah. to them, yeah. you know. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, and the bourbon, and in bourbon, you know, it, almost anybody can just go buy MPG, you know, whatever, distilled, and then barrel age it themselves, bear, you know, bottle it themselves, do their whole thing. And so, you know, usually on the back of a bourbon label, if you're seeing like distilled in Indiana, bottled in wherever the hell, you know, that's usually what you're getting. Yeah. And while that still can be fine bourbon, um, an adequate bourbon, uh, you know, there's just something about knowing, hey, this is the person that 
actually, you know, pr- distilled the entire yeah. thing themselves and, and aged it and bottled it, you know, and uh, yeah, and it doesn't sound like it's completely different. It sounds like in the mezcal world, it's not like you just go buy like I'm gonna go get, you know, some, my liquid from you, and I'm just gonna do whatever I want with yeah. it. Yeah, no, it's really important to give them credit for sure. I mean, it's it, it's like that again with like wines too. You know, it's you know you wanna. Sometimes it's cool to see who the winemaker is and yeah. you know, to read up a little bit about it, whether it's family owned or multi generational or you yeah. know their fa- their grandfather was a big winemaker or something like that. Yeah, pour us up, David. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I've had I've had a, a guest in the podcast, Joel. I don't think you're listening, but uh, uh, Joel and uh, his his fiance Natalie and and their chef. I used to have him on once a month, the local restaurant here in Syracuse, and. Um, uh, I had bought this bottle of Howler Head bourbon for some reason, or whiskey for some reason, you know, yeah. Dana White's banana flavor. Yes, yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I hate it. I absolutely yeah, hate it. I know. It. And, uh, <laughs> and so we were, we were recording at like 9 a.m. on a Saturday, and uh, so we're doing the podcast, and, and I had these bottles out, and Joel's like, I was, I was telling him how bad it was. He was like, I'll take care of it for you. In a 45-minute podcast, he drank the entire bottle himself. Wow. Um, and so, and then I had a couple other guys on Chris, you might be listening who, uh, restaurant partners who came in for an evening podcast and wound up drinking through like three of my nice bottles. Oh my my God. God. Which I was more than happy to share with them. But towards the end of this two and a half hour podcast, the one partner was like punching the other one. Oh my God. You You got all that out. You got all that uh, recorded too, right? For their benefit, I didn't release the entire whole footage. Wow. (laughs) That's funny. So yeah, we can drink up and I don't think we're going to cross either of those. No, 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 no. (laughs) yeah cheers yeah it's a it's a sipper i mean it's you know it's what we you know like i said man we wanted something well balanced and yeah i also think that you know with our mezcal i mean i think one of the the things we love we do a lot of um like tequila mezcal festivals in in los angeles Mm -hmm. and you know different pop-ups and tastings and you know we hear it all we have people that come up and say oh i love mezcal let's try oh yours is the best you know Mm. and then we have other people that are like oh i don't like mezcal it's too smoky and we we love Mm. hearing those people because we love to say well just yeah just give it a try you know i think there are a lot of mezcals out there that really do hit you in the face hard with the smoke it's Mm. just like right off the bat boom here's the smoke i think and open to your opinion as well but i think with ours you know it's a little bit more subtle with the smoke right hitting you in the face it's a little bit you know, it was a little bit more fruit forward. It's a little bit peppery. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you kind of like breathe out your nose and kind of, you know, in your throat, you, then you get the smokiness there, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it, it's it's a mezcal. It's going to be smoky, but I don't think it's as campfire, you know, mm-hmm. like everybody thinks. But, you know, in the cocktails, it's great because then you get, you take that sip of the cocktail and you get it just subtly on the back and it's just... Yeah. You know, the it just adds such a different pro- flavor profile to you know some amazing cocktails right now. I always tell people, I challenge you to go to any legit cocktail bar throughout the United States and find a menu that does not have a mezcal cocktail mm-hmm. on it. You know, and it's you know it's you know, I mean look at tequila ten years ago. I mean tequila was still shooting in you know shots and yeah. you know margaritas and that was it. You know where now you, you, there's so many um, you know there like you said there are a lot of tequilas out there that you know, have a lot of additives and stuff, but there's also some really solid ones that are just great for sipping and, mm-hmm. um, you know, really good. And I think mezcal is it's heading in that direction for sure. It's just, you know, yeah. it's, it's behind tequila, but five years from now, I think we're having a totally different conversation. You know, I think it's, yeah. it's a lot more popular, you know? Yeah. I was going to say like too, as just as a mezcal fan, I mean, yeah. I've had awful mezcals, you know, yeah. and there's, and there's different reasons why, you mm-hmm. know, I've had some that taste like burnt plastic or something, yeah. some really bad ones. Um, but I've had some phenomenal ones. So, we just want people to know, like you know, we want people to be able to try the ones that are the the mes- the way mezcal should be represented by these good mezcals, because I think it could change their minds if they did have like their first experience was. I'm not going to drop names, but you know, I know some of the commercial brands that they're mm-hmm. not very good, and that that's for most people. I would say in the U.S., Americans, generally speaking, we kind of follow trends and like we don't really know. It's like, oh yeah, let me go get the because everybody. Because, you know, it's on the new rap video or whatever, mm-hmm. and that may not be the best representation of mezcal. I think yeah. mezcal is very volatile in that way because, you know, like, again, you know, we've had amazing ones, and we love to try. Uh, you know, we, we still try other brands. Oh, mm-hmm. we're yeah, that's like one of our things. We'll go into bars, and we always love to try, like, oh, let's try that, let's try that. And we yeah. have a lot of favorites. We love Madre. We love Pier de Almas. I mean, we, there's, like, some phenomenal mezcals out there that yeah. that's, how, that's what got us into the – 
the business mm-hmm. in the first place was tasting some amazing mezcals. So yeah. they're out there, you know. It's just, you know, there's there's a couple that, you know, <laughs> just, you know, it, it is what it is, you know. He's like, drop the names, yeah, drop the names. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, 90% of the time, I would say, I mean, maybe not 100% of the time, but 90% of the time, like the celebrity, you know, brands yes. out there, like you're not, you know, you're, you know, I mean, who knows what their process is, you know, from their marketing process to their, you know, the real life process. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of it, I think is just kind of like a, you know, a quick grab, um, yeah. you know, grab yeah. for, you know, money or whatever the case is. Yeah, one but, of our uh, favorite hashtags is we are not paid actors, you know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so difficult. I mean, the, I, I can't imagine what the regulatory process is to like have something that's produced in Mexico and then imported over. You know, even if it's just to Los Angeles, that then gets distributed. You know, how much more <clears throat> thorough that process probably is for you all as a company. Um, yeah, I think like I I started a coffee company, Good mm-hmm. bu- Good Buddy Coffee. Okay, it's incredibly simple. I found the coffee roaster in town that does the best job. And I bought their beans and I put it in my bag with my label and that was it. Wow. You know? um, it's Where do gr- the beans come from? Where do their uh... Peaks Coffee in Syracuse. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sam, who's the head roaster and co-owner, just really phenomenal coffee. Um, Sky Top Coffee in Manlius is, the, with, without question, the best in central New York. They, all, they send pretty much all of their roasts out to uh, be graded professionally from like the national whatever that mm-hmm. grading you know society is and they most of them come back in like the high 90s mm-hmm. um and they get really 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 intense with their they offer some i don't know enough about them to speak on except i've bought a couple but they'll offer really expensive pour overs of like hard to get beans um and so I was just out there a couple weeks ago and had this, I forget what region it was from, but this Mexican bean, they only offer as a pour over, but it's a $22 cup of coffee. Wow. wow. You know, and um, and they only <clears throat> offer it as a pour over. So um, so they're definitely the best, highest quality in Syracuse, but Sam at Peaks makes some of my favorite coffee. And so I just, that was my, that was one of my COVID projects. I had a lot of COVID projects. Of one course. of them was chick, backyard chickens. We were chicken farmers <laughs> for a little bit. <laughs> I was a chicken farmer for a little bit. Um, uh, and then this call, co- I was sitting at my nephew's like second birthday party scrolling on my phone and I got hit for, I think it's called a boy, the boy and a bear coffee out of Los Angeles. Hmm. And um, I got hit with a Facebook ad for them. And I, I, I was like, I was hooked. It just the packaging, the logo, like their whole vibe. I was like, Okay, I'm gonna buy two bags. I had no idea what it tasted like. I paid forty dollars for two bags of coffee. Yeah, and uh, and then after I placed the order, uh, the bell went off. It was like, well, if I fell for this, like if if I can get hooked on not knowing anything about this company, but if I can get hooked on the packaging and the vibe of you know their aesthetic, I wonder if I could start a company that does you know so a coffee company that does that. So. Um, so immediately I text Sam, I was like, if someone was going to buy coffee beans from you, you know, uh, how much would it cost? And they're just, it's incredibly cheap. You know? Yeah. It's like you're paying, I mean, I don't know what it is today because I know coffee has gone up astronomically over the past, you know, couple years since COVID. Did you tell him what you were going to do with it? I mean, was that, yeah. was there like a conflict of interest in that or like was he no. just. No. So, you know, with the Eat Local <clears throat> card, you know, and Peaks is on the Eat Local card, I was really I was like, I'm not going to uh, wholesale to anybody in Syracuse, or like in your area, which is the hardest part because it's incredibly difficult to sell a retail bag of coffee, um, I think even nowadays, because, you know, by the time I spent the, the first of the packaging on the label almost costs as much as the coffee beans themselves, which yeah. is crazy. Right. Um, unless you're buying, you know, hundreds of thousands of them at a time. Um, so... Buying, you know, so the packaging and the label, I'm like, now I'm at six, my cost is six dollars basically for a pound of coffee. Um, and that's whole bean. Forget if you know, buying a commercial grinder and 95% of the people want their coffee ground, which immediately you're losing all of your flavor yeah. and you know, most of your flavor when you're sending out pre ground coffee. So, yeah. um, uh, so then buying the grinder and all that kind of stuff. So, now I'm at like six dollars for a pound. If I sell it retail, you're just over the point of shipping. Go can go from like two dollars to eight dollars. Yep. Well, now if I'm including shipping and I'm selling it for fourteen bucks, I'm out like a quarter. 
you know, so now I'm paying you to, to order coffee from me. But there's not many people, especially in this area, who are willing to spend $14 for a bag of coffee and another $8 to have it sent to their house. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a big challenge. And But wholesale, on the other hand, there's there's a pretty decent margin in the wholesale coffee game. Again, I don't know. I know price. Everybody's talking about prices have gone crazy. But if you're talking about like a run-of-the-mill Brazilian coffee, coffee bean, and, you know, especially if you're at like a medium, well, I guess the roast doesn't really matter, but, you know, nice middle of the road Brazilian coffee bean, medium roast, at least back when I was in coffee, uh, you know, six years ago, I don't know, 290 a pound maybe roasted. So you go out there and wholesale five pound bags that would sell to restaurants and whatnot for like 60 bucks. Yeah. And your, your profit margin's exceptional. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it would, it would be really easy for me to go out there and do it all over again and just focus on wholesale. Um, but I'd be, I've got, I've got eight coffee companies in Syracuse that are on the eat local card, you know, or wow. central New York. Yeah. So I can't really go out there and be like, Hey, I'm happy to promote you and help you get business. By the way, I'm going to go try and <laughs> actively compete against you in the wholesale world. Um, so I ran some Facebook ads, you know, I never really put too much, eff- like as much effort as was required, but none of those things, you know, if there's one, th- I'm tw- 37, God, I almost said 29, I'm 37 <laughs> years old. That's fucking great. I'm 37 years old. Um, oh, no. it's when you say it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> if there's one thing I've learned. It's that very few things in this life, uh, are quick ways to make money, you know, yeah. unless you're, you know. Selling drugs or you know right. a hitman or something like that. It takes that, time, right? Yeah, you got to plant the seed and <laughs> yeah. water it and you know let it grow for right. sure. Yeah. I mean, how so? How long has it been from when you all had the conversation in your car to today? So it was about seven or eight it's years. Been, or yeah, years, almost. Yeah. So we started the LLC <clears throat> 2017. Hmm. That's when we actually made the LLC. So be, yeah. so the process was years before yeah. that mm-hmm. all the tasting and the yeah, traveling and to oaxaca and then obviously you throw COVID in the mix just like everybody else i mean yeah. everything was um delayed and so, but we've actually we actually put the product on the market about a year and a half ago right? yeah. Okay. yeah about a year and a half ago wow so it took a long time you know there's a lot of like you know you know we didn't have anybody to hold our hand and mm-hmm. tell us what to do so yeah a lot of licenses um you mm-hmm. know trying to figure out do you go with the distributor uh do you do it yourself all these questions yeah. and then you're you know you're you're Thinking about, well, if you do this way, you know, you're thinking about the money and all the all these things, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's a lot of licenses, um, so all that just kind of took time. Bumped our head a few times, you know. Yeah. Made some mistakes. You, you make some mistakes. I mean, it's part of having your own business, right? I right. mean, it's you make some mistakes, but you learn from it. And as long as you learn from it and move forward, you know, and and just keep an open mind with everything and just keep grinding. I mean, we're, you know, bootstrapping it. You know, just. I mean, our, a typical day sometimes in Los Angeles is, you know, we'll pick a, an area of town and uh, say Santa Monica or Venice or Silver Lake and him and I will, you know, meet up and, hmm. you know, we're just walking into bars and restaurants while people are doing inventory and just, you know, bring the bottle, a couple of cups, hmm. you know, and just start conversation. And, you, yeah. you know, you get all types of reactions. You get some people that are like, oh, no, we're good. We're good. You know, even though they don't want to try it. Hmm. Other people try it. Wow, I love it. What are we going to do? You know, other people like, wow, this is phenomenal. I'll buy, buy a case right now. You hmm. have it in your car. Yeah, we do. You know, so that's great. You know, that's how we just, you know, and a lot of networking. I mean, yeah. I'm a I, huge fan. I mean, I just love networking. I love mm-hmm. connecting people. I love connecting with people. And, you know, our years as mixologists at the Marriott and Ritz-Carlton, you know, right in downtown L.A. Live, the beauty about that was, you know, a lot of managers and beverage directors and those types of people, you know, come in, they work for two years, and then they go to the next property, and then they go to the next thing. It's always the next best property. Yeah. So when we came out with this, we we did have, fortunately, we had a lot of good people on our side who hmm. said, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a shot. You know, let's, let's uh, you know, I'm at this bar, I'm at this restaurant, we'll give you a shot, which is always nice. It's cool. The best feeling is when they reorder, mm-hmm. you know, because at first it's always going to, it's always like, yeah, I know you. We'll give it a shot. Let me buy a case. Okay. But they could buy a case and it might not even move. Yeah. Or it could just sit there and maybe people don't like it and then you never hear from them again. But I think our our retention rate, like having people call us up, wow, people loved it. We want another case. We want mm. two more cases. Let's put it on the cocktail menu. That has been amazing for us. Like that's that nice. is such a good feeling because we know that people love the product. Yeah, and for sure. That's that's been that's been really great. Yeah. yeah. 
I've got a buddy who, uh, Trey, who's from uh, originally from Buffalo, but he sort of a similar, like he just moved out to Los Angeles uh, after college and, you know, packed up everything he could fit in his car. And I think he had like 200 bucks to his name. And, and uh, he got out there and he wound up getting a job at the Beverly Hills Hilton as a bartender there and was there for, I don't know, I think three or four years maybe. Yeah. And uh, um, maybe to his detriment, his, uh, the, the former CEO of Metro Mattress, you know, here in town, yeah. was out there staying at the Beverly Hills Hilton vacation with his family. And Trey was his, like, personal bartender for his whole visit. Oh, cool. And at the end of his, his stay, he said, uh, you know, they had gotten to know each other over the week. And so he said, you know, if you ever move back home, let me know. Here's my card. I'll have a job for you. And uh, unfortunately, Trey moved back. I'm sure he loves it now. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he moved back here to upstate New York and and we got a job at Metro Mattress. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, when he was out in L.A., you know, he was bartending at like Elton John's Grammy party. Yeah, you know, yeah, just yeah. craziest I mean, we stories. saw some, we saw some yeah, pretty, happens pretty, like that. Yeah. yeah I mean, I Lakers know. championships. We were right across the street from the Staples Center. Kings, now crypto, Lakers but championships. Yeah, love yeah. The Kings, hockey, two of them, SB's Lakers. awards, all that. Hmm. I mean, we've SB's. seen probably every athlete. VMAs. Yeah, we used to. Of. Yeah. yeah, you'd be at the bar, you'd be have your head down, and somebody'd be like, "I get two shots of tequila." You look up, it's Matthew McConaughey. You know, it's just, <laughs> I mean, Tom Brady in there getting drinks. You know, I mean, it, too it short, was, <laughs> too short. Yeah, <laughs> Shug Knight. I mean, it was. Yeah, I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, it was, it was. I wouldn't change anything. I mean, it was the mm-hmm. people I met, including him. I mean, we would never have met if we didn't have that job there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the people we met and the connections we had from there. I mean, it's just, it was. It was, you know, just everything was meant to be, you know, yeah, and it kind sure. of led us to to this point. And I just remember the days of him and I behind the bar sitting there like, I mean, as much as we love mixology and creating cocktails and watching people smile after they take a sip, it's also bartending at the end of the day, you yeah. know, and you, you know, you're dealing with a lot of different personalities and, you know, there's long shifts and, you know, we both had photography careers that we were doing simultaneously mm-hmm. and, you know, you're at, you, you know, you're working and then going to editing at home and stuff like that. But there was many talks that him and I would have behind the bar when it was dead, and we would just be like, "Man, we, you know, we we need something else needs to happen. You know, yeah. we need to we need to make some moves. You know, and it just how the trip to Mexico City, and then coming back, and the idea to do the mezcal, and then to really like, you know, when we when we first came back and told people our fellow bartenders like we're gonna make a mezcal, you know, you almost <laughs> saw them kind of like, yeah, cool, that's a great <laughs> idea, you know, like good luck, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And like that just fueled us. We just we yeah. were like, okay, you know, you'll see one day, you know. Mm-hmm. And like mm. the full circle moment is now, you know, that bar that, you know, we worked at for each of us nine years. Um, you know, it, they're carrying it now. Yeah. That's so cool. it's it's <laughs> really a and cool. like now we go there and do kind of staff educations with some of the people that we used to work with, and it's mm. and they, we get all love. I mean, it's all love. You know, they're like, yeah. wow, you guys, you guys said it and you did it. That's awesome. You know, so it's. It's a great feeling, and we're far hmm. from you know being accomplished, and you know, but it's it's the road; it's in the right direction. You know, I mean, we're we're doing really well, and um, you and, know, we're excited. It, and there was yeah. a time, and we're still, like you said, progressing and learning. And but there was like a period where it was taking probably longer than we hoped yeah. or thought, and then it was like. You know, do you guys got your mezcal yet? And yeah, it was no. like, not yet. Like, you <laughs> know, and it was like yeah. there was like a good, probably like a good couple, two years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you get that question, and like we always knew inside, we believed it, we knew it was yeah. going to happen, but you know, it wasn't. You know, we we didn't know it was going to take a little bit longer. COVID, all that. Yeah. And you know, you just kept getting that. You know, maybe that's our fall for opening our mouth. I don't know. <laughs> we were excited, you know, but we would be, you know, we'd be like smuggling like Coke liter bottles, clear Coke liter of like the mezcal from Oaxaca, you know, back into the states, and then like. We're like, well, we don't have it out yet, but this is it. Like, you want to try it? You know, like we're pouring it out of like a a giant two liter Coke bottle. That's awesome. You know, so it was, uh, you know, but then to like the process, you know, then like finding the bottle and like creating the labels and everything like that. And then, you know, even to this day, walking into a place and seeing it sit on the shelf is, I mean, you know, I started bartending when I was 17 years old here in Mm. Syracuse at the Phantom Club and, Mm. and, uh, (laughs) you know, Tom Taylor and, you know, he was a great bar owner and you know, kind of took me under his wing and, you know, I learned so much. And I remember one of my favorite things to do behind the bar when it was dead was I just would pick up bottles and look at them and read mm. them and, you know, try to learn about it. I was very interested in it. And, and um, it's just, it's crazy now, you know, years later, um, you know, going back and then now walking to bars and seeing the bottle there. It's, yeah. it's, it's a trip. You That's know? really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's one thing I learned from, you know, the, my short time behind the bar, it's like, 
you have just have to have a story of whatever it is you're selling. If it's yeah. the cocktail, if it's the beer, if it's the wine, if you have the story, you know, behind it, and so uh, you can you can pretty much move it to anybody. And so that's what's important about you know the, the companies today is to have that story of whatever how it's made, you know, the importance of it, the quality of it, you know, whatever the case is. Um, the most expensive there's a company a brewery here in Syracuse Underground Beer Lab makes some of the best beers in Syracuse without question incredibly small batch um, small 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 brewery and I would go to order from them like maybe once a week and it's like hey can I get two no you can have one case of this this week and that's wow. it um, wow and it was expensive you know it'd be like nine dollars for a can which around here is you know in the upper tier of, of yeah you know an IPA yeah and people would always flinch at the price. And I'd say, but that's the hardest to get beer that you're going to get. Like, you're probably not going to see that can, for, you know, in a week. Yeah. Anywhere. And uh, and people would be like, oh, really? And they'd jump on it, you know. Uh, that or smoking a cocktail is what I learned. If you want to sell cocktails, just, just smoke an old-fashioned, and you'll have about yeah. 10 people follow up behind that person. Absolutely. Well, they, like, love hey, the process. they love watching yeah. it. You know, <laughs> they love that. watching the show. Yeah, yeah. it's it's... I mean, exactly what you said. Like people see, they, they see something going by with a cool garnish or a great color, and it's like, yeah. I want that, whatever that is. You know, right. I mean, that's how we are. You know, a society is just, you know. Yeah. Is the world of? I mean, I know like New York City mixology. You know, it's like fat washing is you know, in 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 a whole variety of ways and different spirits and methods is like the biggest thing right now. And that's not the case here in Syracuse. Maybe there's one or maybe two bars that are doing it. Is that the case in LA? Is it like high fat washing, or is it more like what is the cocktail? You know, scene a lot in of LA? a lot of shrubs. Um, you know, a lot of different. Um, you know, local. You know, fresh ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's. Um, you know, obviously, you got a lot of tequilas, a lot of mezcals. Um, but people make their own syrups. And yeah, a lot. Of, yeah. yeah, you know, it's. Um, you see some fun stuff. I mean, we we some, we sponsored last year like a mixology contest, and mm -hmm. you know it's cool to kind of see. You know, it's again as ex mixologists behind the bar. We even when we go into restaurants and bars, we do have. I mean, I love coming up with new cocktails, especially you know uh, even for like Elephant and the Dove. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, here here's like twelve cocktails that I think would be really good that mm -hmm. are efficient for people to make on a busy Saturday night, but still flavorful and you know some fun new ingredients yeah. um but we never go into a place and we kind of read the room and kind of you know talk to the bar managers we never go in and say these are the cocktails you have to do mm -hmm. in fact it's the opposite we actually love to see what mixologists come up with there's so many mm -hmm. creative young minds out there who are really trying to expand and come up with just funky cool stuff that really goes with a lot of these spirits and, and you know and we love to see what people do with it. You mm. know, if they come to us and say, hey, you know, like our bartenders aren't really into that, but like, can you come up with some ideas for us? Absolutely. You know, yeah. we'll do whatever you need. And and we love to do that. Yeah. But um, we love to kind of throw that ball in their court and see what, you know, what they come up with, because you see some cool stuff that I never even think of, you know, yeah. and it's, you know, and especially with the food scene these days and, and the just how like the culinary aspect of food, you know, just with culinary and mixology, how they're really coming together over the last few years. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's awesome just to see, you know, yeah. it's pairing things and different foods with this and, you know, just coming up with ideas and different syrups and, and different ingredients and different shrubs that you just never would think of, you know, That's cool. it's really cool. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but, uh, tell everybody who's listening where they can find, uh, you know, your Mezcal here in Syracuse or upstate New York. And then if they can't find, if not in the restaurant, how can they buy a bottle themselves? Yeah. So um, we're in Torchwood Spirits out on 31. Um, and that right now is the, um, there. And uh, I think that's the, that's the only liquor store that has it right now at the moment. We're talking to a couple other ones. Um, but there are, um, as far as outside of Syracuse, you know, you can buy it on our website. Um, um, doscabachos.com and it could ship direct to your door, um, direct to consumer. And then anywhere outside of there, especially California, we're in, if people are familiar with Total Wine and more, uh, we're in 12 of those locations throughout SoCal. They're a nationwide company, um, store. Mm -hmm. Uh, eventually it could be nice to, you know, get into 
some of those locations, but we're also trying not to spread ourselves too thin. You know, obviously being here in upstate New York is important to me. Yeah. That, that means a lot to me as, you know, being in, you know, Northern California for David, cause that's where he's from, you know, is important to him because these are places we grew up and, you know, we, we want to share that with, you know, the, our friends and family who are around. So upstate New York was very important to me. Um, you can find it at some local restaurants. We're in Possibilities. We're in um, Daniela Steakhouse. We're in Alto Cinco. We're in Exo Taco, Elephant and the Dove, um, and uh, Persimmons in, in Clay, Drum, Drumlins, Drumlins uh, Golf Course. Liquor Town, um, Liquor, uh, where's Liquor Town? Liquor Town out in Brewerton. Uh, so we're, we're in some spots and, you know, again, trying to find the right, in the right fit for mm. it, you know, it's definitely more cocktail forward, craft cocktail forward places um, that are really looking to, you know, work with some different mezcals. So, yeah. you know, there's definitely some locations you can go and you can try it and then you can buy it through our website or go to Torchwood and, you know, pick up a bottle or Liquor Town and pick up a bottle. Um, but yeah, if somebody yeah. did want a bottle and it's in, <clears throat> it's not accessible because, yeah, we ship to like most of the states. There's only a couple of states we don't, but mm -hmm. um 20 off DG code, 20% off okay. <laughs> nice. for, yeah, the, nice. for the show. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. 20 yeah. off uh, 20 OFF DG. Okay, cool. 20% uh, off. Uh, they do, you know, when you ship liquor, they, you know, there is a. Yeah, yeah. it that, ends up being you a little know, bit pricey. Yeah. You know, yeah. But the 20% off, that kind of, that helps with that, that helps a little bit. It. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll put uh, links in the show notes and everything uh, for anybody who's listening to go find the website or social media links, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, so make sure you go check them out and if you want to try it, hit up the restaurants and that they lent, they mentioned their liquor stores and thanks guys. Appreciate yeah, thanks, you coming man. In. Thanks, thanks for, for it, man. Thanks awesome. for your time. Yeah, Thank this you. This is great, man.